Today I want to talk about um, some factors to spiritual maturity. Um, as a pastor, I, I talk to a lot of people who are either at a place in their growth where they just don't feel like they're going anywhere. Maybe they don't feel God. Uh, maybe they're at a place where they just don't understand what's going on in their lives. Um, or uh, maybe they're just in, in, in one of those times when it's a quiet time, um, spiritually speaking. Um, there are really so many different different factors to this, but I, I want to look at some of the reasons that I, I, I see people not going anywhere spiritually. Um, it's a very troubling time if you've ever been there. If you haven't, you will eventually probably be there. Um, it is a very troubling time. And uh, this lesson is, is focused on uh, helping you um, find your way through that. Okay, so that's why this lesson is called Factors to Spiritual Maturity. Uh, keeping pressing on to Christ no matter how long or how short you've been saved. So first off, I want to kind of get rid of an idea that we have going around in the church, and that's the idea of the plateau. People say, I'm just plateauing spiritually. Just plateauing. With Christianity, there is no such thing as plateauing. You're either actively moving forward, or you're maybe passively moving backwards. Sometimes passive, passively moving backwards eventually turns to actively moving backwards or actively moving forwards. Um, it, it never stays passive. Um, but the point here is that you you can't reach this idea of I'm just coasting. I reach this place and I feel real comfortable here. I feel really mature. I feel really close to God. And this is good enough. Uh, when we reach that place, we stop. Seeking God. It's like, for instance, um, I was talking to someone the other day who was going through a lot of problems earlier in the year, and they kept pressing into Christ and pressing into Christ, and and, and they just really grew, grew so much. But then, once the problems resolved, they came and said to me, you know, I, I miss those times of trouble because I felt so close to God. See, the, the, the problem ushers us into God's presence. But sometimes when the problem is gone, rather than, than, than keep on seeking after God so that we can have something to lean on, we just kind of reach this place of just, I don't know where, what direction I'm headed in. And that's kind of what I'm talking about with this. So, so realize that there isn't such thing as a plateau. Um, one day you will wake up, or maybe you won't, and that's even worse, and realize that your Christianity is nothing more than a religion. Your, your seeking after God is nothing more than, than the same prayer you've been praying every day. There's no heart to it. Um, your ministry is pretty much revol revolved around you. You, you know, you reach, just reach this place of realizing, wow, how did I get here? Spiritually speaking, I'm dead. How did, how did this happen? And it happens from this, the idea of the plateau. It just does not exist. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is keep seeking after God. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what you feel, press on past that and keep seeking after God. You have to realize that, that he's bigger than whatever situation you're going through and that it is worth it. It is worth it. It may not feel like it now, but once you get past this, you'll realize that. So dispel the idea of a plateau. You're either moving forwards or moving backwards. So can you honestly say to yourself, am I moving forwards? Or I am moving forwards. So also, now I don't want to get weird with this because a lot some pastors go to the extreme of saying you shouldn't watch any movies, you shouldn't listen to any music that's not quote-unquote Christian music. Um, you shouldn't uh, play video games. Well, honestly, if, you, if, you, if you've watched a lot of my videos, you know that one of my resounding themes is balance. Um, for instance, it's not wrong to watch movies. However... I have known some people who are at a spiritually stagnant place because of the things that they invest their money in, because of the things that they waste their time on. Um, you know, look at where your money is going, and that might show where your heart is. But then look look at the movies that you've been watching. Um, for instance, if you watch a lot of horror movies, um, it's very easy to spiritually speaking just reach a very weird place um i don't really know how to describe it it's just a place of, of weird beliefs and doctrines um i'm continually surprised by the amount of people who form their beliefs based off of movies 
like watching The Exorcist and assuming that that's actually how demon possession works. You know, that any time that a demon is involved, that it's going to turn around, you know, and that kind of stuff. Whereas in James, we see a much more practical, practical way that demons are involved. He says that wisdom that comes from, you know, he's contrasting God's wisdom and earth, earth's wisdom, and then he ends up saying that the earth's wisdom is, is demonic. See, once again, you know, contrasting those two things, saying that God's wisdom shows itself in gentleness and in service and love and all these things, whereas earthly wisdom is just focused on self. It's puffed up. It's it's focused on, on, on your own ambition, your own desires. And he says that that is, is demonic. See what I mean? So not exactly what you'd see from the exorcist, but still what the Bible says. Um, but then also uh, music. You know, sometimes we, we listen to this music that's talking about rape and murder and all this, I mean, just nonsense stuff, getting drunk all the time and, and, and partying and all this stuff. And then we wonder why our spiritual life is lacking. The things that we put in are is what's going to come out. Do you want a sweet spirit? You need to stay in the Word. You need to stay in prayer. You need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Um, and sometimes video games too. Um, I, uh, I fully believe that video games are totally fine. The thing is, you need to watch what content is in the video game and how much time are you spending on the video game. A hobby can become something wrong if given too much time. You know what I mean? When it, when it keeps you from the things that God actually has for you. That, that's wrong. You know, if you're spending, you know, 40 hours a week playing video games, I mean, that's that's a job. Um, that, that definitely is a job. You want to keep it to somewhere somewhere below 10 hours. Um, preferably around, like, the five-hour-a-week mark, if not less. You know, keep some realistic goals here. Um, but these are some things that, these are some things that, that, that hold us back from, from spiritual growth. Um, in fact, I was just talking to someone, and you know, they they had this. They were listening to I think it was I don't know Led Zeppelin or something like that, and um, you know hadn't been going to church, and they they were saying some things about you know how they were worthless and all this stuff, and I was saying look, this is here's the thing, you know you you're listening to this music that is basically reaffirming these ideas rather than giving you a a godly perspective, it's giving you a worldly perspective. And and then you're not you're not you're not in the word you're not in prayer you're not you're not uh, joining together with the, with the community of saints you're just kind of out there on your own. And the, you know th this combination is not good. It leads to a place of spiritual death. It just leads there. So I would strongly encourage you look at the movies you're watching, the music that you're listening to, and the video games that you're playing. Um, you know, check to see, check to see. If there are things there realistically, don't just say things because you enjoy the movies, the music, and the video games. But realistically, realistically look and see, you know, is this something that's building me up or tearing me down? Um, also, I just kind of hit on this. Sometimes we try to substitute prayer and Bible study. It is true that you should just pray about things and never do anything. That is true. However, prayer should be first and foremost on the list. Prayer in today's culture is greatly de-emphasized, but James says that prayer, the prayer of a righteous person is very beneficial. It, 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 I don't want to say it works because it's not the prayer that works. It's the God who hears. But with that being said, you know, there is definitely an element of, of prayer does things. There's just, I, I can't explain it, but when we pray about stuff, First off, prayer changes us, but then, but then also as we're praying, we just we find ourselves in a place where God, <clears throat> excuse me, God may not change the situation, but He starts changing us, and we start to see things from a different perspective. You know, I'm not talking about prayer like people make it out to be, where you where you have your little repeated prayer and you go to your corner for five minutes. I'm talking about where you really press through past the past the the formulation, past the the form of it. And you actually seek after God in your prayer. You actually open up to Him and actually speak and communicate with Him. There's a difference between that. Um, and Bible study, um, you know, staying in the Word, I cannot emphasize how important this is. It allows us to see. Remember, if the if the Bible is inspired by God, then that would mean 
that when we read it, we're un we're being able to glimpse pieces of God. You understand that? You're, we're able to understand God. We're able to see how He applies to us. How how what Christianity is all about. For instance. When you read the prophets, you may get an idea of God being this judgmental guy that just wants everybody to die. And then you read the rest of the Bible and you start seeing he wasn't saying those things to be just this judgmental guy. He genuinely wanted to see people restored to relationship with him. He genuinely wanted to see people turn from their sins. He wanted to warn people of what their lifestyle was leading towards. Like with the book of Revelations, a book that was written to encourage Christians and today is used to really abuse abuse non-believers, you know, scare them into the kingdom, and this is a bad thing to do. See, there's a difference between reading the word and understanding the word. Does that, does that make sense? There's a difference between what it's saying and what it means. And how you do that is you compare scripture with itself and you stay in the word. Paul says in Philippians um, um, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At first glance, that may seem that I can do whatever I want. But actually, if you read the context of what he's saying, he's talking about being being content in Christ and being led by Christ and, and, and that being enough in Christianity. Not pursuing the next thing, pursuing the mountaintops, pursuing this, pursuing that, but seeking after God and finding yourself in that place. Um so um, the things that you're putting in, be it movies, music, video games, something else I didn't even mention, um, not staying in the word and prayer, but then also separation from church. When we don't um, join together as believers, we find ourselves in situations that seem hopeless because we have no Christian camaraderie. Um, I know many people who get depressed and then they get into the church and, and they start getting built up in their faith and they start feeling better. They start uh, feeling happy and content and then something will happen and they'll, and they'll start to drift off again. And you have to kind of bring them back up again to get them back, you know, in, in, in with the group. And I'm not saying anything. If, if you struggle with depression, you know how serious that, that is and you know that it's not simply something that you can will yourself out of. However, I have noticed that those people who don't who separate themselves from the rest of the church find themselves here more often. And I will say something even further than that. I was talking to, uh, actually this has happened multiple times. I just feel like I'm separated from the church. Like I don't belong or like I don't fit. Um, I just feel kind of forgotten. Sometimes we feel like this because we are separating ourselves. Oh, I go to church every Sunday. I'm not talking about necessarily going to church as being a church. I'm talking about when you're at church, do you talk to anybody? Do you actually participate in the worship? Do you actually listen to the sermon? Do you actually, when, when the church does extra things, like maybe you are at Halloween, they have something maybe, do you go to those things? Do you go to their Christmas parties? Do you go and actually just spend time with the people? Do you um, do you spend time with maybe the pastor or whatever when uh, uh, some time other than Sunday? You know, do, do, you, do you spend time together? Or are you separated from the church? See what I mean? And being separated from your church, whether you feel like somebody else has separated you or whether you separate yourself, be honest with yourself and realize how what this is doing to you. You need the body, and the body needs you. We were never meant to live in isolation, but everything in the New Testament shows us fellowship, shows us unity, shows us working together. It wasn't just one super enlightened apostle, apostle praying in, in the beginning of Acts. It was a group of them praying together, seeking after the Lord. And uh, things happen in corporate worship and in corporate seeking after the Lord. I can testify that don't happen in personal devotion. I don't understand why. But I will say there are also things that happen in personal devotion that don't necessarily happen in corporate worship. You need both. You know, oh, I have a special agreement with God. I just kind of hang out in my house and don't really do anything. You know, I don't witness to anybody. I don't um, read your, read the Bible or pray, but somehow I have this special enlightenment from God that allows me to sit at home and not do the things that he specifically told us to do in his word. See, I mean, it, there's just such such impossibility with those statements but then also there's the idea of pride my my pastor um said once that that it, the same pride that gets you into a problem is the same pride that will keep you from getting out of it basically what that means is this maybe you are power hungry 
maybe you use your money to get more power. There's a lot of people who do that, especially in older churches where where there's people are established. They kind of think that it's this thing of seizing power. So there'll be these there's these little power plays, and then the person may realize in the future how spiritually they are lacking and that they are doing something that's wrong. But then, because they're so prideful, they won't repent and they won't seek to be restored to the community. See? Because we reach this place. What does James talk and tell us about this? He says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another, so that you can be healed. See? It's the exact same thing that's going on here. You know, that pride, confess your sins so that you can be restored to the body. It's the exact same thing. Um, but then also, um, I've, I've known people who have abandoned the faith because uh, something was said that they didn't like. Um, obviously, that led them to be to be in a spiritually in a place that was just a very drifting place that really had no direction in life, um, really backed off in, in their in their walk with Christ. And if they would have just humbled themselves and realized that God was trying to work character in them. To the annoying situations, the annoying people, God's constantly trying to work character into us. Okay? God literally will use anything to conform us to the image of Christ. Anything. Um, within his character. Okay. So, um, pride definitely is a factor to us beca not becoming mature. Seize the opportunity to learn. Proverbs says that the fool is the one who doesn't want to learn, but the wise person is the one who, who, who constantly listens, who has all these counselors around him. He, 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 he pays attention to discipline. He, he pays attention to these things, and he, and he listens to what he can learn. And that's, that's, that's definitely not nothing. Um, so... And just be aware of pride. Humble yourself. Listen to what the pastor has to say. Listen to what people when when they have something to say. You know, obviously there's there's gripey people, but you can always glean from everything, even from your enemies. You can glean something. Um, also, not surrendering your life, trying to live life on your own terms, doing it your own way, and then expecting the effects of following Christ. It just doesn't happen. You cannot choose to live your own way and then have a different result. It just doesn't happen. It, it doesn't happen. Um, and so surrendering your life really involves a lot of different things. Um, you know, maybe it's a, a sin that you struggle with. Maybe it is, um, you know, your money. Maybe it's your power. Maybe you see yourself as really important. Maybe, um, you, I mean, there, there's so many different things. Um, seek after the Lord, and, and, and when you ask him to show you these things, he will. Give it time. Keep seeking after the Lord. Go to prayer with the mindset, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm not going to quit after today. I'm going to seek you today, Lord. And uh, if I run out of time, tomorrow I'm going to be here again. And this is this is what I'm what I'm about. You know, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Oh, I'll read my Bible later. No, do it now because you'll get too tired later. Something will happen. Um, if you have a family, your kids will be demanding of your time. Your wife will need something, something. If you have time now, do it now. Do it while you still have a chance. Selfishness is another factor to spiritual maturity. Um, a Christless religion, basically. Trying to have the religion aspect of, of, you know, doing all the things right. Or maybe doing them for your own pleasure, though. Um, I'm a teacher at the church, so you can get a pat, a pat on the back. Oh, I'm a pastor. So that you can get money. See what I mean? There's just things where in the Christian life there's very much this temptation to have a Christless religion where it's not about Christ. Christ was all about suffering for doing good. He was all about serving others. He was all about laying down the things that you deserve for the sake of God's kingdom. And yet what we do is we have a selfish religion. Um, how does this apply to me? Um, am I going to be benefited of this? I don't want to volunteer my time because my time is just too valuable. I have other things going on. You know, just this real selfish attitude. It's all about me. It's all about me. Um, our church is a food pantry, and I was talking to one person, and I said, what, what do you think a, a church could do in this area to make an impact in the community? And he said, 
if they would find some way to serve the community um, and, and resolve the issue, because there's a lot of poor people here, and, and, and maybe if they if they did something like that. And I just thought it was funny because he was at a food pantry. That's something that is a financial investment for a church. That's something that's a time investment for the people of the church. Um, you know, a, a selfishness. When you're not, when everything that you're doing is for yourself, to make yourself feel more validated, to make yourself feel more important, to get power, to get money, to get this or that, rather than saying, "How can I serve you?" It's all. It's it's not about me. Yeah, I have written on my de desk. It's not about me. I, right here, I keep it on a little notepad that I've taped to my desk because that's something you need to remind yourself of every day. Your Christian walk is not about you. Christianity is not about you. I could say a lot more about that, but I, I really think that I really think that if you just stop and listen to what I'm saying, it's not about you. It's not about you. You'll really start to understand the core of Christianity. And once you understand the core of Christianity, it's a lot easier to grow spiritually. And it is possible to be saved and to not understand what God is about. It is possible. Um, so with that, we are done. If you have any questions, please post them below. Um, just want to want to encourage you. Be aware of what you're putting in. Are you hanging around with people that are that are really robbing you of, of, of character more than you're hanging out with people that are pouring into you? Are you only pour, spending time with people who pour into you and not pouring into anybody else? Are you being discipled and then discipling others? Are you listening to things that, that are watching things that aren't good? Are you, you know, um, where is your time going? Where is your money going? Watch these things and uh, have a close walk. watch on your walk.